Hello, Booktube, and welcome to another weekly reading vlog. Uh, apologies about last week's weekly reading vlog, which cut out unexpectedly, I think, at about 25 minutes, 26 minutes, or something like that. Uh, I'm using my phone as a camera now, which doesn't have quite the old limitations that my old camera did. But uh, I think what happened is I just forgot to, to clear up the memory to delete old videos, and then I just ran out of memory at 22 minutes. Or, ordinarily, I have, a, I have a little bit more flexibility on this camera to go above 30 minutes, but uh, as one of the rules I set for myself, I'm going to do my best to keep this 30 minutes or thereabouts. I've, I've got a little timer running here. Um, because, uh, yeah, any more than 30 minutes is just getting ridiculous. But I've got a lot to talk about this week. I've um, talked into a few different books that uh, have, have a lot in them. So I'm going to be doing my best to just get through stuff as quickly as I can. And then inevitably, there will have to be some thoughts that get left unsaid. So uh, books for this week are... Uh, these two here, The Moral Animal, Why We Are the Way We Are, The New Science of Evolutionary Psychology, a rather long subtitle, by Robert R Wright, and The Grammar Book, an ESL-EFL Teacher's Course by Marion Celsi Mercia and Diane Larson Freeman. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about King Arthur, The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle, because, uh, number one, I didn't read any pages of this last week, uh, and I finished writing my review, I published that on my web blog, uh, I finished uh, the video review of that and posted it up to this channel, you can check that out, um, but now I am all done with this book. So now that I'm done with that book, that fl frees up a slot in my reading list uh, and, and the number of books I'm currently reading. So um, what I'm going to try really hard to do this year is not start any new books until I've knocked off all the half-read books that are currently sitting on my shelf. Uh, that requires a degree of self-control, which historically I've not been good at. I have a bad habit of picking up books, uh, getting a third of the way or about halfway through it, and then starting to get a little bit bored with it, and then seeing something else on the shelf or at a bookstore and think, ah, I would love to be reading that book right now. And then thinking to myself, I can balance two of them, uh, and sometimes I can, um, or at least sometimes I could back in the old days. Uh, but quite often, one of the books will just end up getting unread on the shelves, and then I've got a stack of currently reading books that are, you know, ten books, and at least five of them I've not touched for six months. Um, especially now that I've uh, got a child, a uh, toddler in the house, um, I, I can't balance multiple books at the same time. That, uh, I could to a degree when I was single, but uh, yeah. So I've got, I've got about five books on my shelf that I, I'm halfway through to one degree or another. But the one I picked up for this week is uh, The Moral Animal. Um, so let me give some background on this book. Um, if you're, if you've been following this channel, you may note that this is somewhat off-brand for me. I tend to stick to uh, fiction, uh, history, uh, and then linguistics or language teaching, and that last one is, uh, is just purely because of professional development, because I happen to work as an ESL teacher. Um, Popular science has not been on my reading list. It's not something I often talk about on this channel. But this book uh, came onto my reading list about three years ago now, when a friend of mine, friend and co-worker, wanted to set up a non-fiction book club. Uh, at the time, 
uh, again, three years ago, three and a half years ago, almost now, we had uh, among our group of friends and coworkers, two book clubs going. One was a fiction book club. And one was a book club for professional development where we read stuff related to English language teaching. Uh, we had a friend who was getting a little bit, wanted to branch out, so he wanted to start a third book club for general nonfiction not related to English lang language teaching. Um, <clears throat> so I and a few of the other guys gave it a try, but in, in the end, uh, three book clubs proved to be too much for us, and nobody or very few people ended up actually finishing the book at the time. Um, actually, let, let me back up a little bit here. I, I maybe will try to explain why I'm using a copy that's been pirated off the internet with some apologies. Uh, so I'm currently living and working in Vietnam, uh, and those of you who have lived abroad will know uh, access to English books can be hard to come by. Uh, Vietnam is, is a particular case of this, more, more so than other countries I've lived in. Um, the, the, there are bookstores, and you can find books if you're not choosy. But if you are choosy, if there's a particular title you want to track down, well, good luck to you. Now, uh, it's easier now than it was, I'm sure, 50 years ago. Uh, you can, uh, th there are Kindles. I don't have a Kindle. Uh, some people order stuff through Amazon. Getting stuff shipped into Vietnam is a little bit touch and go. Um, but I don't, I don't really have a credit card or an Amazon account set up to do that. So when, when we want to get books... Uh, we will often just try and find a PDF off of the internet and then print it up. Uh, one good thing about Vietnam is there are printer shops everywhere, and they will print and bind something like this for you. They're quite used to it. Uh, the Vietnamese themselves do it all the time. Uh, copyright law is not strictly enforced here in Vietnam. Uh, and uh, I would not do this if I had access to a normal bookstore that I could just buy this at or order it out of. Uh, I'm only doing this because of scarcity of options. That being said, I, I do recognize there's a debate to be had around this. There are some people who would be of the opinion that even given the scarcity of options, it's still wrong to print out a book like this, and I respect that point of view, but I've, I've given myself some latitude on it. Um, so, yeah, that, that's how I've ended up with, uh, this book like this. Um, so I, I got into this, uh, where did I get? I think I got up to about page 189, uh, three years ago, uh, which, which would be about, uh, this much of the book. Um, but uh, then, then got distracted by other things and did not finish it. It's sat on my shelves ever since then. Uh, I've considered moving it to my abandoned books category, where uh, you know the books I've decided I'm just not going to finish. But I've been wanting to return to it for a couple of reasons. One, it, it wasn't half bad. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, obviously, I guess it couldn't have been that engrossing or I would have, uh, w would never have gotten distracted in the first place, but, uh, but it, 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 it wasn't bad. It was ma mainly for external reasons that I got distracted. Uh, and it was really messing around with the way I thought about everyday interactions, um, and to such an extent that I thought, okay, well, I'm going to have to talk about this book in some form or another, because it's it's really changed the way I view a lot of what goes on in everyday life. So the book is um, about evolutionary psychology. Uh, you can see that in the subtitle. Uh, it's, it's about why we humans do all the things that we do, uh, including some things that appear to be very irrational, 
from the perspective of uh, evolutionary, evolutionary psychology, what our genes are making us do. Now, uh, uh, the, the, the book, and again, I, I, I didn't finish it, uh, but the, the part of it I did got, get through. On the one hand, it was making a lot of sense to me uh, and explaining some areas of my life that uh, I had been somewhat of a mystery to me. On, on the other hand, I found it somewhat depressing uh, to see all of what I viewed as emotions or feelings that I had viewed maybe as part of a, a higher plane of existence being reduced to just uh, just talk about genetics and the gene wanting to pass itself on and how these genes are tricking us into having feelings or emotions that we genuinely do feel, but we're feeling them for Darwinian reasons. Uh, I've been an agnostic for several years after having been raised in the Christian faith, so uh, I'm not, I'm not, I've been open for several years to the idea that life could possibly be meaningless. Uh, I'm not happy about it, but it's, it's been something that I've been open to, or, or o o open, open to maybe sounds like a, it's a little bit too receptive, something I've been considering. Um, but in, in spite of that, I, I still found, still like to cherish this idea of human emotions or human consciousness as being something a little bit on a higher plane. Uh, and this, that's an illusion that's hard to maintain when you're reading this book. So in that sense, uh, it does, it does, it does get a little bit depressing. On, on the other hand, um, it, it does have, very good explanatory value for things that are otherwise a, a bit of a mystery as to why we do a lot of seemingly irrational things. I'll, I'll, I'll give one example that springs to mind, and this actually, this isn't in the book. Uh, the book was published in 1995, I believe. Uh, so before social media. But uh, th this is an extrapol extrapolation from the material in the book that I, I think could j very easily be applied to the stuff on social media or to our obsession with social media. Now, I'm reluctant to admit this for obvious reasons, or, or maybe not so obvious reasons, uh, um, but for whatever reason, we are, most of us are reluctant to admit just how much emotional value we put into social media. Um, what, why are we reluctant to admit that? Well, hold that thought. Maybe we'll circle around to, to that in a minute. Um, but, you know, I find myself, and again, I'm, I'm very reluctant to admit this, but uh, after I post something on Facebook, uh, checking 10 minutes later to see how many likes it's got, uh, see how many comments it's got. Uh, after I upload a video, I'll check uh, that week to see how many views or likes or comments it, it gets. Uh, checking several times a day, uh, occasionally to the point where it will distract me towards other things that I should be getting done instead of checking my social media. Um, and obviously I'm reluctant to admit that because it makes me sound sad and lonely and pathetic. Uh, but there you have it. And uh, I will quite often ask myself, why Why am I doing this? Like, uh, who, who cares how many likes a video gets? It's not, it's not more money in my pocket. It doesn't make me happier. It doesn't improve my life in any material way. It doesn't improve my relationships with the family and friends and the people closest to me. Um, but you think about it, and there, there is probably a very good Darwinian explanation for this, namely that those views and likes and uh, affirmative comments, and not the negative ones, but the, the affirming ones, uh, are all proof of uh, social acceptance uh, by our peers. Uh, I mean, it's... it's Something like YouTube is not your peers, it's people you've never even met 
quite often. But uh, your brain doesn't know that because your brain evolved in an ancestral environment in which you were living in a small community in which everybody knew everybody and which if you had social acceptance from them, it means you were part of the group, you got a share of the food, you got helped if you were injured. Uh, it, was, it was a matter of life or death, whether you were socially accepted within your group or not. Um, whereas if you did not get social acceptance in your group, uh, that means you weren't going to get married and pass on your genes. Uh, you weren't going to get a share of the food. Uh, you, you weren't going to get help when you got sick. So that's, that's why our brains are so addicted to reinforcement that we are getting social acceptance. And that's why we get so addicted to social media. Uh, so th there's a perfectly good Darwinian explanation for this seemingly irrational obsession with the likes and comments and, and views on social media. Now, it, it, again, that, that's an extrapolation from what's in the book, but it's, it's once you get into that mindset, uh, you start extrapolating like crazy. Uh, and it's, it's based on the portrayal that the author gives in the book about the ancestral environment and what the ancestral environment was like and how our brains evolved to it. And then once you get that in your mind, it, it's fairly easy to extrapolate to, to all sorts of different things. And in fact, I found myself doing that uh, three years ago when I was reading this book. You know, I'd be in the office and somebody would say something and it would make me feel happy or sad. And then I think... Ah, uh, right. Why am I feeling sad about that? Oh, well, obviously, this has to do with back in the ancestral environment, what this comment would have made. Or, you know, I, I just I just found myself doing that for all walks of life. So uh, to, to the extent that this book really messed around my way of thinking or changed my way of thinking while I was reading it, it was something I really wanted to get back to. Ah. <sighs> 17 minutes. I've, I've used up so much talking time already, and I haven't even talked about what I read this week. Okay, so I uh, picked this book up from the shelves, and because it had been March 2018 since I last made any headway on it, uh, I decided to just go back to the beginning. Um, so went all the way back to the beginning. I'm keeping my own page numbers, uh, because there, there wasn't page numbers on this PDF. There are there are page numbers occasionally uh, from the original PDF in here, but they don't line up with the actual pages. So because I like to keep track of how many pages I've read each week, I've been writing my own page numbers in with pen uh, and uh, have gotten up to page 162, which is almost where I left it three years ago. I've made good progress this week. Um, it's probably helped that this week was a, a week off from work, um, so that, that uh, uh, gave me some time to plow through it a bit. Um, the main section was about sex and marriage, and because I've rambled on for so much, I don't have a lot of time to talk in detail about what he says, but uh, basically, the, the Darwinian view of sex is that um, for a man, there's no cost to having sex from a Darwinian perspective. It's a chance to spread your genes every time you have sex, uh, and there's no inherent biological commitment. Uh, you could have sex with one woman one day and another woman the next day or the next hour, uh, and there's no biological reason why you couldn't do that. Um, for the woman, though, uh, spreading her genes is going to involve nine months of waiting, uh, followed by, you know, a longer period taking care of the baby. Uh, and that those nine months are going to be time during which she's not going to be able to uh, experiment with any other man's genes. So she has to carefully select which man she's going to get the genes of in order to, to replicate her DNA, her, her genes, which, which all leads to the fact that um, 
men are extremely desirous of sex, uh, aggressively desirous of it, uh, and um, will will actively seek it out. Whereas it's in a woman's genetic interest to be more coy about sex and to be very careful in selecting the, the type of man that she would have sex with. Now, there, I'm, I'm oversimplifying drastically because he's actually got a whole lot of provisions and explanations and talking about how marriage evolved and how monogamy evolved uh, and uh, polygamous societies versus monogamous societies uh, and a whole bunch of stuff, which is interesting reading. I'm not going to have time to get into it because I'm coming up on my self-imposed time limit here pretty quick. But that's, that's the, the gist of the Darwinian view about sex. Um, now that, at, at the risk of exposing myself, uh, I should say that that actually makes very good sense to me. And that jives very much with my anecdotal experiences in the dating scene. Um, however, it's, it, it, not everybody likes this view. Uh, because there are certain maybe views associated with modern feminism that said women like sex just as much as men and this whole double double standard is something that society has imposed upon us to, to make it think that it's okay for a man to go out and sleep with a lot of people, but it's not okay for a woman to go out and sleep with a lot of people. Um, and so there, there's, there's a school of thought which views that explanation as a right-wing reactionary or sexist, which is something I thought I remembered him addressing in this book, but actually upon rereading, I'm not seeing it. Maybe it's in one of the appendices in the back or something, but at any, at any rate, it is out there. And maybe if you've had some experience with feminist discourse or dated a feminist, you, you're familiar with some of this. Um, so, so it, 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 it's a debate. Uh, I, I found myself very sympathetic to at least the core argument. He's got a lot of auxiliary arguments that go off of this that seem to get further and further into the realm of speculation in which it made less degrees of sense to me as he went along. Um, but I'm evaluating this purely as a layperson, just, just by what kind of seems to jive with my common sense. And not with any, not with any knowledge um, about how in the scientific field is. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna. Th th there, there is so much more to talk about, actually. So much more to talk about, but I've used up almost all of my time. So I'm gonna jump in here to the grammar book. Uh, this week I read from pages 40 uh, to 60, which is chapter three, the lexicon and chapter four, which is about the copula and subject-verb agreement. So uh, the lexicon, I'm not going to talk about a lot of that, uh, other than to say there were a few different things in this chapter which reminded me of arguments I heard before about from the generative semanticists and the linguistic wars. Uh, talks about how the semantic um, the, the semantic meaning of a word will determine sentence structure. Talks about the, the notion of prototypicality uh, in, in uh, word classes. Um, so it's, I guess it's just another reminder of how a lot of this stuff will, even, even though it can be quite daunting to read your first book on a subject, uh, the more you read, maybe the more it will gradually come to coalesce. Is, is starting to be my experience on this. I, I, uh, th there's references at the end of each chapter, a biblio bibliography, and I was expecting to see some of the generative semanticists in here because, uh, again, this, a lot of this seemed to jive with what they had been talking about. Um, and I didn't really accept uh, for a book by George Lakoff uh, called Metaphors We Live By. It's uh, G. Lakoff here in the, uh, where is it? Somewhere here uh, in the, yeah, here we go. 
G. Lakoff, and M. Johnson, uh, Metaphors We Live By, which is a book actually I've heard talked about before. Michael Lewis and the Lexical Approach uh, has mentioned that book. I've never read it myself, but now that I've read The Linguistic Wars, I, I know who George Lakoff is, so that's, that's just an interesting connection. Then it goes into the copula and subject-verb agreement. Now, they've got a whole chapter on this, chapter four. Now, when I was initially starting this chapter, I was thinking, okay, th this is probably for people who are new to grammar. I've been teaching English for a number of years. I know about subject-verb agreement, and I know about the copula verb. Um, but what's really neat about this book uh, is they get into a lot of depth on everything. So they talk about the copulas. They talk about how the B verb is unique among copulas. It's, it's one of the only copulas uh, that can have an adjective, a noun phrase, and an adverbial phrase after it. Most other copulas are only followed by uh, adjective phrase. With They give two exceptions, though become, and become, in fact, historically, as they point out in their footnotes, uh, is related to the be verb. It means kind of come to be. Uh, and then turn, like he turned traitor, uh, for example. Um, and then they get into subject-verb agreement. And what's interesting about their rendition about subject-verb agreement is they say, okay, Present tense, third person singular, you have the S. If it's a uh, first person or second person, or if it's the plural, there's no S. Really simple. So, I walk, you walk, he walks, we walk, you all walk, they walk. Except, and, and again, this is what makes this book so interesting to read, or so useful, is then they get into all the troublesome cases about subject-verb agreement, which goes on for how many pages? Uh, which goes on for like nine pages. Yeah, nine pages from 60 to 69. Um, so talking about collective verbs, talking about uh, words that end in an S, like comics or news, talking about titles of books where there is an S on them, talking about nouns like trousers or scissors, talking about um, the phrases like a number of and the number of, talking about using fractions and percentages, uh, majority and minority, uh, talking about using numbers uh, and equations, talking about using all of, lots of, plenty of, talking about uh, none, all, each, and every, um, talking about, what else does this get into? Uh, talking about relative clause antecedents, uh, clause and phrasal subjects, uh, talking about either or where one is singular or one is plural. So like either your eyesight or your breaks. Uh, so eyesight singular, breaks plural. Uh, neither nor. Uh, talking about uh, the principle of non-intervention, uh, which is, for example, when you've got a uh, a noun noun subject, but in the singular, but maybe like a prepositional modifying phrase in the plural. Um, and it's, uh, you know, some of the stuff is stuff I've been asked by my students in the past. Uh, for example, something like 10 minutes is a long time. I remember something similar to that, where one of my students says, shouldn't be 10 minutes are a long time. And, you know, I had never thought about that before. Uh, you, you know, the life of an English teacher, you, you learn about uh, all these problematic cases by a student catching you off guard for issues you never thought about before. Um, and I was like, yeah, it should be, but 10 minutes is a long time actually sounds right to me. Or 10 minutes are a long time doesn't sound right to me. Uh, and and it, that that exact issue and a lot of issues like that are in this chapter here on subject-verb agreement. So I find this really useful. What I find slightly discouraging, though, and this maybe has more to do with me than with the book, is as I've said in previous videos, this is my second time through this material. I, I read this all last year, 
and before shelving the book and have not gone back to the beginning. Sorry, uh, I think the, the video just stopped. I, what I'm going to try and do is uh, combine videos and editor, which I'm figuring out how to do on my computer now, uh, so I'm not going to upload two different videos here. But uh, what, I, what I was trying to say right just before the video cut out is I had read all this stuff once last year, and then when I come back to it again this year, find like it's very much like reading it for the first time. I had remembered vaguely that there was an extended discussion of subject-verb agreement in which a lot of the stickier cases or whether the a lot of the exceptions were explored. But unfortunately, I had not retained in my long-term memory what that discussion was or what all the rules were or what discussions were um, talked about, which is, at least for me, the problem with reading grammar books. And again, I've, as I've mentioned in past videos, I have read some stuff on grammar before in the years past, but I mean, I, I would, since, since I'm an ESL teacher, I would love to just store all of this in my brain and have it on immediate recall for any situation in the classroom when a student asks a question. But I find it just so hard to get that information on immediate recall. I find that I read it in the grammar book and then it, it just doesn't stick long term. I mean, the, 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 the stuff you teach over and over again every year, of course, sticks. Uh, you know, the different meanings of the present perfect or something like that. But um, all the other stuff that has to do with the, the, the students just asking off-topic questions uh, is very difficult to, to get to stick in the memory. So that, that's one thing I'm thinking about as I'm reading this book and how to... I don't know if maybe I should reread this book uh, every year or something like that, which given what a slow reader I am, I'm hesitant to do. It's difficult enough for me to get through it once. It takes up a substantial chunk of my reading time. But uh, yeah, that that's, uh, that's the trade-off. Is on, on the one hand, there's so much useful information in here that's uh, really informing me a lot about grammar. On, on the other hand, I have a feeling that in six months to a year, I'm going to be remembering very little of it. And, and that's always discouraging when you're trying to study something. Uh, and, well, that's that's the human dilemma, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to sign off here.